Today, Lord, we're going to stand in your word before the entrance of your word. Give us a light. We're going to use that light as a guide to our part and alarm to our feet. If your church must grow, your people must know what does say the Lord. Today, Lord, we ask for receptive heart and listening ear. And we thank you, Lord, in advance what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Glory to God. Be seated. And turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let their dead bury their dead. And see what God's saying to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. These words are forever settled in heaven. Heaven and earth will pass, but my words will not pass. Hallelujah. Every time I look at some of these things and faith come it by hearing and by hearing and by hearing and by hearing by the word of God. And the Bible says if everything that Jesus Christ had done was put in the books, the word itself can hold the books so they leave a lot of things out to leave this in. So this has to be very important. Hallelujah. First Corinthians chapter 15, look at the 26 verse. The last enemy that should be destroyed is death. So death is an enemy. Uh, death is an enemy. And we look at that verse and Paul said everything that I received I got it by revelation of Jesus Christ. So here it said the last enemy, look at that verse, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And think about it, when God created us, he didn't create us to die. But he said to Adam, if you eat, we're going to die. Well, he wasn't talking about physical death because Adam lived to be 930 years, talking about spiritual death. So when he ate there, he was taken from light to darkness. And we have to wait until the last Adam come to take us from darkness to light. Then we look at people in the old covenant. We look at some of the people who live long in the Bible. We look at Methuselah, which is the oldest one, 969 years. The first Adam lived to be 930 years. We look at Noah lived to be 950 years. Or that before the flood. After the flood, we look at it. After the flood, we look at Abraham lived to be 175. And look at his son Isaac lived to be 180 years. And his son lived to be 175 years. Joseph was 110 years old. Joshua was 110 years old. Job was 120, 140. And we look at Moses was 120. So we look at all those folks live back then, but they live and they die. But then you have some people who never die. You don't have any debt for Abimelech and Nebuchadnezzar. You have no debt for those guys. Some people live and die, some never live. When you come to the new covenant now, you don't have no debt. How old was Paul? How old was Peter? You see, when you receive Christ, you pass from death to life. They tell you how old was Moses and all these guys. How old was Paul? How old was Peter? How old was John the Baptist? You see, once you come on this side, you don't die, you pass from death to life. In the old covenant, they live and they die. Some people never live. Their name is not in the book of life. Their name is not in the book of life. When it comes to us now, we pass from death to life. Anyone that received Jesus. So look at here, he said, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Hebrews 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And see what God is saying to us. Amen. Jesus. Hebrews chapter 9. Look at the 27 verse. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. Hebrews 9 and verse 27. As it appointed unto man once to die. After death. The judgment. Well, you see, this body that we live in have a shelf life. The spirit is eternal, whether up or down, the spirit is eternal. But this body, the days of the years, is three scores and ten reasons and ten four scores. That's the body. You see, we don't get a new body. Our, our redemption is in two parts. When we receive Christ as Lord and Savior, we get part one. We didn't get part two. You see, part two is waiting for you. You see? So when we receive that, we get that. But this body, the outward man is perishing day by day. But the inward man is renewed as you receive Christ. You know? So you get part one, but you didn't get part two. 
part two is waiting for you in heaven. Look at Second Corinthians chapter 5. Hallelujah. We're waiting for the redemption of our body. Then will be no death. Let the dead bury their dead. You're going to die. From a physical point, you're going to die. And there's a process to go through. And nobody could get used to death. When my mother died, she died 84 years old. And don't care how much time, how much Holy Ghost you're filled with. Death is an enemy. Death is an enemy. I don't care if the person is old as Methuselah. Death is an enemy. Your body always fight against it. Because it was not made to die. It's an enemy. It's an enemy of God and of man. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 1. We know that if our earthly house of this tablet could be destroyed, we have a building of God, a house not made with eternal. So that's part two. When you die, you're going to get part two. When you receive Christ, you send down part one, take out the old and you put a new. But the outward man, he's perishing day by day. And sometimes you see somebody thinks of God and say, well, how could he smoke? How could he drink? How could he be unfaithful to his wife? How could he do things like that? The body isn't saved. You see, a body is not saved. So how could he be a man of God and he did that and you know, your body is not saved? And if you're not in a place like this to, to suppress the body, Paul says, I keep under my body. I was wanting to put it, I was wanting to keep it. You see, you could take this and you put it there and you go on, you put it. But to keep it, you see, prevent it from doing what yes. it wants to do all the time. Yes. Yes. He said, I keep under my body. Because the body wants to smoke, wants to drink, wants to party. The body wants to do anything it wants to do. And then you're not feeding it enough. The average person feeds their body three meals a day, average person. But they feed their spirit one time a week. And many times you go, you know it, I know it, God knows it, and the devil knows it. They feed their body a cold snack. Well, your, body is, your, your spirit is no match for your body. You see? You don't come to church. You don't come to Bible study. You don't do nothing. You just come here and you're gone. Well, you don't match. Anything comes... You see? So you get part one, but you didn't get part two. When you get part two, well, then the transaction is completed. But when you die, there's a process that you go through. And you have to know as a Christian. When you die, they have to have a... What's, we look at some people who die before. How they die? Well, in this present time we live, when you die, they have to have an, aut an autopsy. They want to find the cause of death. Well, how you die? And technically, Brother Tony... That, wherever you die, that's the, technically is a crime scene. Yes. Yes. Let me say it again. If you die upstairs here, you die in your house, you die in the hospital, in a nursing home, that's technically, that's a crime scene. Yes. Yes. Until they take that body and have an autopsy to determine what's the cause of death, yes. that's it. We have seen that. The police have to come and stay there and not, not move yes. and stay right here. Yes. Yes. Until the autopsy, the coroner give the report that the cause of death is natural. But sometimes somebody could poison you, you could be strangled, you could be yeah. whatever, whatever. And you have to wait until you get the autopsy and tell her what's the cause of yes. death. Yes. But if anyone you should just technically he have to stay there until the police come and they consider that a crime scene until they check it out and the coroner will tell them, well, it's natural to a heart. Mm -hmm. So you have to have that. How you die? Because you remember the thief come not but to steal. To kill and destroy. After that, the third, after he determined what's the cause of death, they have to take the body and put it into the morgue. Well, the morgue is really a freezer. That's what the morgue is—a freezer. Put the body there, prevent it from decay. All this process have to go through. When they put it there, now somebody have to come to claim it. They have to show papers that you're the father, mother, brother, sister. I've been down that street many times. They don't just come and give you the body. I come, my name is Mike. No, no. You have to prove that that's your brother, that's your father, that's it. Prove that. When you do that now, they're going to release the body to you. The more going to release the body to you. Give you right. Now we have to go to a funeral agency, a licensed funeral director, with that paper. And when you go to him with that paper, he wants to speak to you. 
Number one question, is there any insurance? And you pause for a while, well, we have to check it out to find out if there's any insurance when you go to the funeral because he don't want to take the burden and put it in this place and he can't get paid for it. We have had that here in this ministry. They take the burden and put it in the place there. When the, you the father doesn't have no money and the, the funeral agency take the burden and ready to embalm it, they, have, they want $1,500 because they embalmed the body. I have to now pay them $1,500 to take it from there to put it to my people over here. They said they're not releasing the body until they get $1,500 because the girl, whatever, she didn't know what she was doing. She said, and they went to pick up the body and go on with it. And they embalmed the body. We want $1,500 or we're not releasing that body. So when you do that, you go there and they give that, to talk to the, the insurance, what you're going to do with it. And they agree how you're going to pay. If there's no insurance, they run a check because all this time the, the body is in the morgue, in the, in the morgue still. Until they could find out how they're going to repair, they run a check for if the nursing home, if they have some insurance, if government, they find something before they take that body. Because they could get stuck with that body. When we make some kind of agreement, well, we, if it's me speaking to them, well, they know who I am, so we, they take the body now to their place and they're going to embalm the body to prevent it from decay. We discover how we're going to do this work here to embalm the body. And now we have to bring clothes for this body. You have to bring clothes. What you're going to wear this body with. And they're going to ask you, do you want to cremate or you want to bury? Well, some people want cremate. Some people are asking all these questions, asking them before they make a decision because the price very depends on cremation or burial. You bring the clothes over there, you have to do that. Now you decide that you're going to bury. They bring out a book with many different coffins. Pick which one you want. They have coffins from $1,500 to $50,000. Pick which one you want. And when you make your decision, which coffin you want to do, well, all right, we're going to take it from here. What coffin you want to do that now, and then they want to talk to you where you want to bury the body. If you want to bury it in New York or New Jersey, the price vary. All this is taking place, let the dead bury their dead. If you're going to bury it in New York, they give you some prices around here. Some of the cheapest one is like $5,000 there. You can get something about $1,500 in Jersey. And the price keep climbing. You want that. If you want the roses, you want this, you want that. And they keep ticking off things all the time. That price keep going up. Let the dead bury the dead. And you're making that decision to bury better in Jersey. We've selected Jersey many times because it's cheaper. Most people don't have the money. Let the dead bury the dead. After we get through that now, we want to find out where you're going to keep the service, over there or the church. There's a price for keeping it there, or if you want to keep it here, the church. Where are you going to keep the service, my brother? All this and the price is climbing all the time. When we decide, all right, we'll keep it at the funeral place, or we keep it here, we make a decision. All the time the price is going up. They keep adding stuff. Let the dead bury the dead. When we come to that now, limousine service. You want to be picked up and drop off? How many people you have? How many limousines you want? Let the dead bury the dead. Yeah. <laughs> and limousine service, if you're taking it to Jersey and all that, tell you all this, the price, because if you're taking it right here, taking it to Jersey, the price is going up all the time. So limousine service, how many you want? Then you have to give them the address of all the people who have to be picked up. Where do we pick them up? Can you see that? Limousine service. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to get to the obituary. What is an obituary? Obituary tells a story about the dead person, a biography. Where you was born, your husband, your wife, your children, your education, things you do. That, that tell a story about you. The obituary tell that story about you. So somebody have to have that information to tell about your brother, your sister, where you work, where you were born, that kind of stuff. A biography of the person. All this time, who's making it up? You or them? All this time, the money's climbing. The obituary. After we finish with the obituary now, the eulogy. What is an eulogy? To speak well of the dead. So somebody have to tell a story 
from a spiritual point, speak well of the dead. But sometimes, based on what we look at, some, some, some people that, you, what good you can say about them? <laughs> Sister Hazel, what are we going to say about some of these folks? Well, a eulogy speak well of, to speak well of the dead. But somebody, what are you going to say? Unless you want to lie. My brother was really a saint. Child of the devil in and out of prison, shoot with the FBI and all that, but he was a saint. <laughs> so you have that, you have the obituary, you have the eulogy. And now we're going to take the journey to the cemetery after we discuss how we're going to do that. When we get to the cemetery now, we're going to say it for a while. Let me say this to you. When you get to the cemetery, better kind of, if you want to see them put the body in the ground, you have to pay for that. If you want to wait around here for them to put it in, you have to pay for that. They could leave it hanging there until whenever they put it in. But then the danger is that is they could dump that body and take that coffin and run with it. So stand around there. You, you, every time they go by the hours, more I would say to look for, wait, I want to see them put my brother, my father, my brother, my wife in. The, you have to pay for that. Let the dead bury the dead. You ready for all that? Yeah. We have to stay there till that happen and put it in the inhume the body and so on. Now we come back here to the city for repass. What is a repass? Uh, come back to eat some food to fellowship. You have to have some place to do that. But we are finished with the cemetery yet. Now you have to pay for a memorial plaque to put on the grave. And more words you put is more money it will cost. So make it simple. Mike Jones, the date of his birth, the date of his death, that's it. For the more words you put on that plaque is more money it will cost. So keep it simple, K-I-S. Keep it simple. You hear that, Brother Calendar? The more words you put on that thing is more money you have to pay. If you just put one John Doe, date of birth, date of death, that's it. Then you have to place, pay them for putting the plaque on the grave. So the plaque could run anything from a thousand to two thousand dollars, depends on the word, the lettering you want, the kind of styling, all right? All that, it costs money for all that. Then you have to pay them six hundred dollars or so to put the plaque on the grave. Let the dead bury the dead. Let the dead bury the dead. So all this we're doing there now, after we've done all that now, you see, or when people are wrong, everything is... But then you know what happened? The period of mourning starts. And that could be hard. And we're going to look at sometimes, sometimes, if you don't have somebody around you to sort of hold you up. You see, everybody gone now. You bury the dead, everybody gone, the repass is finished. Now you're all alone. To think about what you're going to do. About your husband, about your wife, and the, the life, life to move on now. Let the dead bury the dead. Look at something here in the book of Genesis, chapter 37. The period of mourning, expressing grief, act of sorrowing. After you've been through all that. Genesis, chapter 37. And look at this behavior here. When they tell Jacob that his son has died, look at his behavior. Hallelujah. Everybody's gone now and you're all alone in the house. We had a friend here, remember the many conversation here, his uncle died and the wife stayed in the house there. She don't want to speak to anybody. They tell her, auntie, you need to get married, you need to get your life. No, she said, when he died, he took my heart with him. She stayed in the house there, just wallet died in the house there. Nobody knows she was dead there for months. And Satan will play with you if, you if you don't have somebody to comfort you and tell you, listen. Let's move on with this life. And you could stay there living in the past. Going up the downstairs. And because nobody does, you see, again, my script, my people are destroyed because they don't know. Look at it. When they tell him this, look at this, look at this behavior. Genesis 37. They tell Jacob that Joseph is dead. Look what he said. Look at his behavior. Look at two verses. Hallelujah. Look at 34 and 35. Look at those two verses. Jacob rent his clothes and put on sackcloth upon his loins 
and mourned for his son many days. Look at verse 35. All his sons and his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. He said, I'll go down to my grave, to my son mourning. Does the father wear for me? I'm going to weep until I die for my son. And some people like that. By the time Joseph was dead, he said, I'm going to my grave mourning for my son. And you could hold on to that, and you could get in that area there, and life doesn't mean anything to you anymore. And sometimes there's, there's, there's work for you to be done because you were predestined. You were predestined. You have a work to do. And that doesn't negate the call. That's right. Because your mother died, because your father died, because your wife died. You still, you have a work to call. Sometimes the right. next person coming to life could be the greatest thing for you. Amen. He or she could take you a place where you've never been before. Amen. Amen. But you're so busy looking at the review mirror mm -hmm. and not looking at the windshield. Your review mirror is about eight inches, <laughs> but the windshield about four or five feet wide. Look ahead. But look what he said. I go into my grave moon for my son. Later on, they tell him Joseph was alive, but that's something else. But people like that, they hold on to that and they just, after you've been all that, you've been through all that process. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to moan. Second Samuel. Chapter 12. There's a period to mourn. And sometimes you personally live a very ungodly life. Sometimes, you know, it's hard to say it, but you say, well, it's better to go on. You're not a productive person, you know. For lack of better words, like a parasite. What does a parasite do? It live off other people. All the benefits are to the parasite. He doesn't give nothing back to you. Somebody say he's picking on my family today. Yeah. People like that, they're like parasites. They're not, they're not contributing anything to society also. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12. And David went to bed with Bathsheba. And look at this. 2 Samuel chapter 12. <coughs> And I want to pick up, let's pick up the story at verse 9. Amen. Let's pick up the story at verse 9. Wherefore thou hast despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in the sight of the Lord, to kill Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house, because thou hast despised me, and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Amen. Thus said the Lord, Behold, I raise evil against thee out of thy own house. I'll take thy wives from before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. Shall I with thy wives in thy sight of the sun? For thou hast did this secretly, but I do this before Israel and before the sun. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. How be because of this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child that born of me shall surely die. Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that you are while bear to David and was very sick. David therefore besought the Lord God for the child, and David passed and went in and lay all night upon the earth. The elders of the house went in to him and raised him up from the earth, but he would not. He did eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. Now this is the first child that Bathsheba is having. You have no record that she have any children with Uriah, her husband. And this is her first child. And the child lived for seven days and died. You talk about a depressed state. That's your first child. Live for seven days. Now when you go a little lower down in that same chapter, go down to verse 24, at that same chapter, David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and he went in on to her, and she lay with her, and bare a son, and called his name Solomon. The Lord loved him, sent by the hands of Nathan the prophet, and said, the name shall be called Jedidiah because of the Lord. You imagine what it's like for you to have your first child, and it die. How depressed you could be. But notice what David went, he went in and comforted her, and gave her next child. And she had Solomon, she also had Nathan, she had many other children. But sometimes, if you not, you don't have somebody there to comfort you. You notice what he said in the verse there? David comforted. Yeah. Now, how many people have comforters? Mm. If you have somebody there to talk to you, mm -hmm. all the people come to the ministry had to be comforted. Because mm -hmm. their life was such messed up. Mm -hmm. And tell them there's, there's light ahead there. Everybody come to the ministry. We could say this on radio and television over 50,000. Not a single person come with a good report. 
Not one. And you have to change that conversation. All your life you had before. Once you enter that door, the old things are passed away. Whole Lord will become new. You are a new creature in Christ. Everyone. You say the wrong thing to them, they kind of mean you. You ruined their whole life. Words. He comforted her. He comforted her. Now some people have nobody to comfort. They don't know what to do. After the repast, after the, everything is done from the cemetery, they go in there, lock them behind a closed door. Nobody has to talk to them, tell them anything. And Satan could very well enter in and ruin your life. You not just lose that husband or that wife or that child. You lose your, your own life. Yeah. He comfort and give our child. Give us something to hold on to. Yeah. Give us Solomon. After Solomon, give us Nathan. Give us other children. Give us something to do. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. He comfort her. Mm. He comfort her. My wife had that too. We lost that child of miscarriage and when you talk about uh, the depressed. But because you know this comfort her, give her an extra. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Jesus. And you could go through that if somebody is not there. Yes, Somebody's not there to comfort you. Amen. Can you see that? Yes. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 18. Second Samuel chapter 18. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Now they kill Absalom, David's son. He said, don't kill my son. Leave my son alone. But look at his behavior. David had many kids and many wives. But that is something else. That is an enemy of both God and man. Look at David. This my, look at his behavior. Remember, David was anointed from the time he was a child. Yeah? He's a stripling when the king, when um, Samuel anointed him to stand in that office. Stripling. Look at this. Look at this. Brother, if you don't have, thank God for the word of God. Thank God for a ministry like this. Amen, amen, amen. Brother. Thank you, Jesus. You, you, I mean, somebody said, well, you, you, somebody said, you boasting. You're not boasting. People come in, brother, kind of talk from the floor. You should hear, I have all the personal struggles. I have all the personal struggles. You see, the office have name and address and telephone number, but the office have that. I have the personal struggles. And to see them today in ministry, them as husbands, as wife, as But you, to, brother, you said the wrong thing to them. Instead, you lift them up, you help push them down yes, more. Right, yes. And I come to the house of refuge mm -hmm. to get blessed. Instead, I get them to lift me up, I get them to push me down. Yes. Look at David, behavior. No. Second Samuel chapter 18. Look at the 33rd verse. Mm. And King David was much moved and went up on top of the chambers over the gates and wept. And he went thus and he said, Oh my son Absalom, oh my son Absalom, would to God I have died for thee. Oh Absalom, my son, my son. All the country seen David Akin. He said, I wish I die. I wish you would just live. I wish I die. And I mean everybody see David just weeping for his son. I went to find his son to train me in a pit, you know, and find out his son there. And he just crying for his son. That is something else. That is something else. You see that? For the king was much moved and went up on top of the chambers over the gate and wept. And he went thus and he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, would to God that I had died for thee. My Absalom, oh, my son, my son. You see? And mourning could be something, and you could, you could stay there if you don't have somebody to comfort you and to pull you out of that. Everybody coming there. I mean, you, you hear some stories. I said to myself, How could these people live with that kind of stuff? But thank God the ministry just turned it around. Hallelujah. And you see them walking. Hallelujah. I see them with husbands, with wives. You see them with me. It's just bless you. Bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Second Samuel chapter 21. Jesus, Hallelujah. And look at Rispa. They take all the seven sons and hang them. Right. And look at her sons. Her two sons is just hanging there. I mean, oh, I mean, and think about this, my son. These folks were not saved. 
And because of what Saul did, I want seven sons of Saul and take them and hang them. Two of the sons are real person, and she's standing there for a whole season watching her sons hanging up there. How would you feel? How would you feel? I mean, she'll never have closure. She'll never have closure to looking at your son just rotting there. Look at it. Second Samuel 21, look at verse 10. Rispa, the daughter of Ahai, took sackcloth and spread it upon the rocks from the beginning of harvest until the drop, till water dropped upon her out of the heaven and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest upon them by day nor the beasts feel by night. So all she just, she living there watching that the sun's hanging up there. Because of what Saul did to the Gibeonites, I want seven sons. And two of them is Rispa's sons. And they hang them, they can't move them. Or part of the penalty for what Saul did, I want seven sons, two of them. And she's just watching her sons rotting up there. And the birds come and chase them by day. The wild beasts come and go. Remember who died in the field? The beasts going in. The birds or the boys are going. In, and she watched her son just rotting there. And David heard about it. Prophet Tamar come and take the bones and bury it. You're reaping. You're reaping. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Hallelujah. There's a life for you to live and you was called. You were predestined before the foundation of the world. <laughs> you can't do nothing about that. You could do what you, you could cry if you want to cry. You were predestined. And that doesn't negate the call of what God has in your life. And sometimes that other person, there's always replacement. Sometimes better, sometimes not as good, but there's always replacement. There's always replacement. Always replacement. Don't stop there, don't, put, don't park the car there and say there's, no, there's, there's replacement. And sometimes, sometimes you have to move the big trees out for the small trees to grow. Sometimes you have to get rid of that man, that woman for something to move into your life. Yes. Yes. Don't look back, don't look at the rearview mirror. Look at the windshield. Look at the windshield. You can go places you've never been before. You could explore things that you've never done before. You could do that before. Move on with your life. But all this will tell you in the ministry. They, and you hear some hurt that they had. How people could treat some people like that. How some men could treat their women like that. We have said every week. Hallelujah. But to turn that around, tell them, no, this, you could live. And I see them later on, walking along the aisles. Sister, can I say walking along the aisles? I told you so. I told you so. Yes. Brother Tony, I said that a hundred times. I told you so. I told you so. See them walking down the aisle, dressing. I said, I told you so. I should bottle some of those tears. I'll be selling tears today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, told, I told you so. I said, I told you so. I told you so. I hear all the stories. Matthew chapter 2. And let's pick it up with the 12 verse. Matthew chapter 2. Let's pick up with the 12 verse. And see what God is saying to us. Matthew chapter 2, let's begin with 12 verse. Being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed unto their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and beat out there till I bring the word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And was there until the death of Herod, that might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I will call my son. Herod, when he saw he was mocked of the wise men, he was a seedly road and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the course there for from two years old on under appointed time that he did inquire of the Lord. And was fulfilled which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah, there was voices heard, lamentation and weeping, racial weeping for her children, not because they were not. She, I mean, she, uh, you can't comfort her children. She, they kill her kids, and I mean, she's weeping and mourning, and she'll go to her grave. Rachel weeping and mourning for children, not be comforted because the children of the kill all the children from two years old. Kill all the children from two years old and then the hot children are taken up in the body. Look at that verse. Look at it. Which was fulfilled by, which was fulfilled by, spoke by Jeremy the prophet saying, In Ramah there was voices heard, lamentation and weeping, great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, not her child, her children. I would not be comforted because there was not. And some people, I mean, you could get there, and I mean, you could get in that place there. 
I mean, nothing could comfort you. You could be there, and you could be there, you could be there. Let's turn the corner a little bit and see what God is saying to us. Look at the book of Ecclesiastes. Hallelujah. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. Glory to God. Let the dead bury their dead. And see what God is saying to us in his holy, written, precious Amen. words. Amen. Amen. Jesus. Jesus. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Hallelujah. Let's speak about verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Let's speak about verse 1. And see what God is saying to us. In everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant, a time to pluck that was planted. A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. Yes. Oh. Right there. Look at verse 3. A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down and to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stone, a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, a time to refresh from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep, uh, and a time to cast away, a time to sow and a time to silence, a time to speak, a time of love, war, time of peace. It's a time. So see, don't let the morning go on and on and on. Because in the meantime, if I had stayed there, where would you be today? You see? But you see, that doesn't negate the call of your life, what God has for you. You see? It's a time to mourn. It's the time to stop mourning and move on. Look at something here in Genesis chapter 23. Hallelujah. Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All these are stories. And keep this before you. These folks were not saved. You are. There's a time. Genesis chapter 23. Look at verses 1 and 2. Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. The years of life of Sarah. Sarah died in Kirchah Abad, the same as Hebron, the land of Canaan. Abraham mourned for Sarah and weeped for her. Yeah, he mourned for Sarah and weeped for her. Go a little door down in that same chapter. Look at 19 and 20. He mourned for her. He weeped for her. Look at 19 and 20. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave in the field of Machpelah, the Mamre, the same as Hebron, the land of Canaan. The field and the cave of Darin were made sure to Abraham a possession, a burying place, the sons of Heth. Go over to the 25th chapter. Genesis 25. Genesis 25. Look at verses 1 and 2. Look at verses 1 and 2. He mourned and he wept for Sarah. Look at verses 1 and 2. Again, Abraham took a wife. Her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimram and Jukshan and Midan and Midian, Ikshaw and Shua. He took a wife. Now think about this. Think about this. When we met Abraham, he was 75 years old. When he had Ishmael, he was 86 years old. When he had Isaac, he was 100 years old. His wife died 127 years old. He's 10 years older than his wife. So he's 137. At 138 years old, he married to Keturah and have six sons. You see, at that age, you say, well, come on, man. You know, Sarah, 127, he's 10 years older than Sarah, he's 137. At 138 years old, he married to Keturah. Look at it. Again, Abraham took a wife. Her name was Keturah. And bear him Zimram and Jukshan, Midan, Misha, Ishbak, six sons. He busy sexually <laughs> at that age. At that age, what's your problem? Yeah, he wept for his wife. He mourned for her. He buried her. But he took a wife named Keturah and has six children with her. Go a little lower down in that same chapter. Look at verses 7. Go down to verse 7. These are the days and years of Abraham's life, which he lived a hundred and three scores and fifteen. Abraham gave up the ghost, dying, good old age, an old man full of years, and was gathered unto his people. His son Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zophar, the Hittite, and the field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth, 
but Abraham buried Sarah, his wife. Quite a story. She at 127, he's 10 years old, and she remarried to Keturah. You see? And sometimes you could stay there in that state and worry yourself away at that age. Because, well, just retire. So he married to Keturah. He had six children with Keturah. Look at this. You see, if you follow these principles, if you follow the Bible, say forget principles. Genesis chapter 2. Hallelujah. Jesus. At that age, he married to Keturah, had six children with Keturah. Amen. Amen. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 2. Pick it up at the 18th verse. The Lord says, it's not good that man should be alone. God said that. You're smarter than God. <laughs> You're smarter than God. He's been here from everlasting to everlasting. Huh? Right. The Lord God says, not that a man should be alone. I make my help meet for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the year, and bore them unto Abraham to see what he will call him. Unto Adam to see what he will call him. And whatsoever I call every creature, that was the name thereof. Adam, he gave names to the cattle and the fowls of the year and every beast of the field. Adam, there was not found help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He slept and took out one of the ribs and closed him with flesh instead thereof. And the whip is the Lord God had taken from man. He made woman and brought him unto Adam. Adam said, now this is bone of my bone and flesh of my shall be called woman because she taken out a man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother cleave unto his wife and shall be one flesh. They both were naked, the man's wife, and they were not ashamed. What do you want? He following, he following the instructions. <coughs> it's not good that man should be alone. At that age, at that age, he mourned for his wife. Because the only person we know he had is Sarah. You change your name from Sariah to Sarah. And she died 127 years old. He's 10 years older than her. He married a cut too. It's not good that man should be alone. Hallelujah. Jesus. Let's try to close with this. I think time is about up for me. I'm not looking down to the Bible because they might give me a sign. <laughs> Don't know what sign it is, if it's a good sign or a bad sign, so I'm not looking down, looking down. Amen. Genesis chapter 50. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 50. I look at verse 1. Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept for him and kissed him. Joseph commanded the servant of the physician to embalm his father and the physician embalm in Israel. Forty days were fulfilled for them. The fulfillment of the days of those who were embalmed. The Egyptian mourned for him three scores and ten days. So 70, 70 days. He could have mourned for his father. When the days of the mourning were passed, Joseph speak unto the house of Pharaoh. See, a time for mourning. You can't mourn all the time. It's a time to mourn, a time to sup. But you, after a while, you go up there and there's things to be done, there's children to raise, there's, there's things to be done, business and like that. It's a time to mourn. You see, they give you a bunch of time to mourn, and after that, cease and desist. And keep going on and on and on, and sometimes you have nobody there to help you, nobody to talk to you, and nobody give you this kind of in information. And a good life with education, with looks, with everything, and you could comfort some other man, you comfort some other woman. But because you lock your head in and you're not doing what you're supposed to do, you see? But it's a time. After that time of mourning, cease. That's it. You see? It's a time to mourn. Time to stop. Deuteronomy 34. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 34. And see what God is saying to us in His holy, Amen. written, Amen. precious words. It's a time. As we look at the book of Ecclesiastes, this is the time. This is the time. Yes. And do these things. Not because I say, because you get the scripture for it. You have it in the Bible. Amen. Amen. Don't let your good life be wasted. Amen. You know? We look at those before how they treat their dead. Just throw them in the pit. And I mean, they just treat their dead very badly. That's not the way. That's not the way. That's not the way. But that's the way the dead treat the dead. And you're not the dead. Treat them well. There's not a single person that comes to the ministry. I mean, all kind of people, all kind of people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Nobody could ever say that I treated them badly. Mm -hmm. 
You know, we deal with you. I have to rules to follow in the house, yeah. like everybody else. Yeah. But nobody can answer. I treat them bad. Yeah. You know, and I see in all those life changes. I go look back. The rest of me, I mean, is something else. Because yeah. I was treated right. Yeah. It was treated right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Deuteronomy 34. And let's pick up at verse 5. Yeah. Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And they bury him in the valley of the land of Moab over against Beth Paul, but no man knew it of his sepulchre to this day. Yeah. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes was not dim, his natural force abated not. And the children of Israel wept and mourned for Moses in the plain of Moab 30 days, so that the weeping and mourning for. We have to read that again. Yeah. You see, mighty man, I did already, but 30 days, that's it. Party's over. Party's over. You see? I like this appeal of follow this guy. He said, at that age, his eyes was not dim and his natural forces abated not. You see that? We're going to read that again. After 30 days, the period of mourning is ended. Mighty, you know, you bring us out of Egypt. You did all these mighty things. You opened the Red Sea. We know. But 30 days of mourning has ended. You see? Look at it. Verse 5. Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab over against the, uh, according to the word of the Lord. They bury him in the valley of the land of Moab over against Beth Paul. No man knew it of supper unto this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes was not dim and his natural force had abated not. Look at the eighth verse. And the turn of Israel wept for Moses in the plain of Moab 30 days, so that the days of weeping and mourning for Moses was ended. After the mourning, just enough is enough. If they're not even saved, and they could do it for 30 days, you save, you full of something, I don't know what it is. So you need to do 30 days and that's it, party's over. Let's get on with the life. Amen? Amen. Stand to your feet, give yourself the hand, you've been good. Amen. Hallelujah, come on, make some noise. Hallelujah, glory to God, amen. amen. Jesus, 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 hallelujah. Come on, make some united noise. Hallelujah, glory to God, amen. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You want to give those that are viewing on television and listening on radio an opportunity to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior? Bible says, not my wish that any should perish. He doesn't want anybody going to hell. Hell was not made for you. Hell was made for the devil and his angel. You don't have to go to hell. All you have to do is to say yes. You don't have to fill out any form. Quit your job. Leave your husband, your wife. Bind any kids. Give up your apartment. Change your name. Fill out a form. Bring some money. All you have to do is to say yes. By saying yes, you leave the kingdom of darkness. I move the kingdom of light just by saying it. If you're already saved, we want you to stand proxy for somebody who's not saved. But if you're not saved, stand for yourself. Repeat these words of me from the bottom of your heart. Heavenly Father, Heavenly you said in your holy word, whosoever come to me, I'll in no way cast out, but I'll take them in. So I come to you. You didn't cast me out, but you took me in. And I thank you. Romans 10, verse 13. Whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I call upon your name. So I'm, now so I'm now saved. Romans 10, Romans 10. verses 9 and 10. 9 and 10. With a mouth confession is made unto salvation. Is salvation. But with a heart man believer unto righteousness. So I confess with my mouth, so confess with my mouth the, Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus that he died, that he died went to hell, went to hell spent three days, spent three days and, three and three nights just for me. Just for me. Because, I because I confess that with my mouth and I believe that in my heart. I'm now, I'm now saved. I now become, I now become the, righteousness the righteousness of God, of God in Christ. In Christ. 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 521. 521. Jesus, Jesus, you represent me in heaven. And I will, and I will represent you on earth. You on earth. Jesus, Jesus, I thank you, I thank you for what you did for me, did for me on, Calvary, on Calvary, shedding your blood, shedding your blood to, redeem me to redeem me from the curse of the law, of the law. spiritual death, Poverty, Poverty and sickness. And sickness. Satan, Satan, you're no longer my Lord. No longer my Lord. Jesus, Christ Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Lord and my Savior. And my Savior. I'll live for him. I'll, him. I'll serve him. I'll, him. I'll study his words. I'll, his words. I'll, be I'll be a good example for all to see. see. And I thank, thank you. In your name I pray. Name I pray. Amen and amen. amen. Glory to God. Give them a hand. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. The Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out in the mouth of God. What is he saying? 
What food is to your physical body? The word of God is the spirit. As you feed your body, make time and feed the spirit. Because you spirit, you live in a body and have a soul. Feed your body, feed the spirit also. That's number one. Number two, don't forsake the assemblies of the brethren. Christians need to be with Christians of like precious faith. If you're not with Christians, you're not with Christians. People are not saying sound godly thing. The Bible says, watch what you hear. What you hear will affect your faith. That's number two. Number three, be loving one to another. You as a Christian should not hate people because they're black or white. They're born in this country or born abroad. Have a belief different than yours. You disagree. If you want to build up to hate them, hate is of the devil. God is love. If you're not loving one to another, your faith is not going to work. Faith working by love. If this man will know him by disciple because you have love one to another. That's number three. Number four, pay your tithes. Very important. 10% of the money you work for. That's not your money. God said to bring all the tithes in the store that we meet in my house and prove me now. We haven't said a lot of hosts. I not open you the windows of heaven and pour you on, bless me, no one to receive it. If you don't pay a tithe, the Bible says you are cursed. With a curse, with a man rob God, how did he rob thee? If you can live on 90% of money you work for, you cannot live on 100%. I tried it, it didn't work. Give God his keep, yours be blessed and become a blessing to others. Not to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, we give you some basic instruction against that. That's not all. That's a good place to get started. You need to read your Bible on a daily basis. Amen. Don't wait until you come to church, you go to a prayer, you do a crusade to read your Bible. Read your Bible every day. Ask God to lead you to a church that will feed you spiritually. Don't go to a church because your friends go in there because there's a church down the block or across the street. That may be so, or that may not be so. Ask him to lead you. When he leads you there, submit to that authority. Be a blessing to them. God will bless you. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this time that you have given us. Thank you for the opportunities and privileges. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who make all this possible. Thank you for the victory in Jesus. There's victory in other. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory, but all we come to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Give yourself a hand. Hallelujah. Jesus.